Hello, welcome to Waypoint Survival. Today we're going to be answering eight questions and sending out five tags. Stay tuned. So this tag comes from Really Big Monkey One, and I appreciate Dave for uh, tagging me on that. And so uh, we're going to get started right away and answer these questions. First one is, what is your most memorable camp? I've been camping a lot over my life. I'm 45 years old, and so I've uh, been doing this quite a while, and so I had a hard time kind of thinking, what was my most memorable camp? But the first thing that really comes to mind is, oh, about 15, 16 years ago, in the fall time of the year, a friend of mine uh, named Steve and I, from our local area here, went down to the Daniel Boone National Forest in Kentucky and uh, we were planning to do a three-day, two-night uh, backpacking, wilderness, excursion, whatever you want to call it. And so he had been having some serious tooth issues and uh, had uh, needed a root canal and had it scheduled but it hadn't happened yet and so the doctors had him on some pretty heavy pain medication. And so I remember uh, we got down, oh, maybe most of the way, two-thirds of the way there, and he got really, really sick. He said, man, I got to pull over. So we pulled over, and he was sick, and he was vomiting out all of his food, and he was just yucking all over the place. And he got back in, and he said, man, I can't drive anymore. You're going to have to finish it up. So I finished driving down. We got to our parking area, got to the back of the Suburban, started unloading all our stuff, putting on our gear. And he's just really woozy and lightheaded. And uh, by now we've lost so much time, it's dark, we're hiking at night, we've got our headlamps on. And so we're hiking down the trail and we find this little bitty ledge of an area. And uh, he looks at me and he says, man, I can't go on any farther, I'm, I'm done. So I said, all right, you know, this is, this is gonna be camp. So we just threw out our, our bed rolls and our sleeping bags and found places for our backpacks and uh, gathered wood and started a fire. It was fall, it was pretty cool. And so uh, we ended up having a nice fire and, and he was still feeling really kind of not so good, but his stomach started to settle down. And so we decided that we were gonna cook the steaks that we had brought uh, that night. And so we carved ourselves some sticks and impaled the steaks and stuck them out over the open fire, began to roast it, you know, as you do when you're in the outdoors. And we were so hungry by that point, I will never forget uh, just juice and stuff. I, I don't think that it was all completely cooked, but it was just running down our, our uh, faces and we're sitting across the fire from each other and we're, we're grunting and groaning and carrying on like a, a couple of guys uh, from the cavemen era. So uh, it was pretty funny and uh, we, we had a pretty good night that night. And then we got up the next day and we hiked, I forget, it was eight or nine miles over really brutal terrain. And uh, we both had pretty heavy packs because we were uh, testing gear and doing different things. And I remember that being a really, really rough trip. And that next evening and afternoon, uh, the temperature had dropped so far that uh, when we got to where we were meeting, another group of people were coming out to spend the, the second night with us. They were backpacking in. Uh, I actually started to shiver uncontrollably with mild hypothermia. And I knew exactly what was going on, and so uh, it was dark, and I immediately stripped down my clothes. I had dry clothes with me. I put dry clothes on and then fired up my little stove and uh, made some hot chocolate and uh, began to, my body began to, you know, warm back up. But I'll never forget that. That was a pretty close uh, brush with actual hypothermia. And it's just one of those things to note that it was in the fall of the year, but I'd gotten really sweated. I was, I was thoroughly hydrated. It wasn't a problem with that. But uh, just the fact that I was just so sweated and exhausted, a combination of factors, the dropping temperatures, and it's probably easier, as, as many experts have said, to experience hypothermia in the fall of the year uh, because of that, because you don't really think it's that cold, but then your core temperature starts to drop. So you just need to have to be able to take care of that and know what to do. Question number two, do you prefer solo camping or social camping? Well, I really like solo camping. I, I enjoy going out by myself and doing things. I like testing myself and my gear. But I actually prefer to camp with one other person. Sometimes two, 
three at the max. A group of four is about about right, but uh, I can go either way with the camping, uh, social camping, or solo camping. Uh, a lot of it depends on what I'm trying to do personally. I'm testing myself or some gear, or sometimes there's just nobody available with their work schedule and families and things to go with me, so I end up going by myself. Question number three. What is your favorite knife? Well, my favorite knife is my knife. This is the Big Brother Bushcraft Blade. It is a knife that I designed. I have a review video on it uh, where I showed some of the uh, features of it back oh, in my, somewhere in my video history. But it has a convex grind. It's a five and a quarter inch blade, 1095 high carbon steel. Uh, it has black canvas micarta slabs on it. It's got jimping on the spine. And uh, I, I did design this. It's got a, a palm swell in the center along with grooves for friction and uh, quarter inch holes there for lashing. If, if I should wish to lash it on a stick, I don't really recommend that, but I like the, uh, the way that look. Of course, they're pinned and epoxied on. And then uh, nickel silver bolster with uh, stainless steel pins in, silver soldered on. Uh, it's a drop point blade and uh, it's made of uh, 1 8 inch, I'm sorry, 3 16 inch, uh, like I said, 1095 steel. And I do all the grinding and tempering myself as I, I am a custom knife maker. So that's my favorite knife and I carry it around everywhere. My second most preferred knife is of course my Mora Cans Bowl. I've been carrying Moras for quite a few years, but uh, this is probably, uh, this is a more recent purchase. I just got this last year, and I really like this. Of course, I carry it in a cross draw fashion. You'll see me in a lot of videos with this. And uh, I use this for a lot of my smaller camp chores and tasks. So uh, that is my second choice, but my first choice is the knife that I designed, uh, just from my experience in bushcrafting and survival. Question number four, where did you learn all your bushcraft skills? Well, that's a long answer. I'll try to give it to you briefly. Uh, first of all, as I said before, I'm 45 years old. When I was five, we moved from Florida to Middle Tennessee. And uh, it was so heavily forested that my father, my uncle, and my grandfather literally had to log out and clear out the area so that we could put our homes in. And so we had a big spring in our backyard and down one of the hollows. We had two hollows on either side. We lived sort of up on a ridge area. And uh, from a very uh, early age then, I was very much in the woods and in the fields, a lot of open areas there in that part of rural Tennessee. And uh, my dad used to read me a lot of stories, me and my brother and uh, my sister and my mom, the parts of our family, we would sit down. Uh, we did not grow up with television, and I know that may seem odd in today's world, but uh, it taught us all love of, of reading, and I was pretty much never in the house. Uh, when I wasn't in school, and during the summertime especially, I was gone, I'd be traveling for miles back across the, the, the valleys and the hills and, and the fields. And of course, back in those days in that part of, of Tennessee, nobody really cared too much that you wander around. And I was always very respectful of other people's property, of course, so it wasn't a big deal. But uh, from a very early age, I was always out in the woods, building forts, making trails, uh, learning trees and, and uh, different things, the berries you could eat. And so I was always very much into that. Wanted to join the Boy Scouts but my parents were, were quite poor and didn't really have the money to do that. And uh, that's not a knock against us, I think, because we were poor. Uh, it was one of the reasons I learned to make a lot of things. I got my first uh, backpack for Christmas when I was four years old. Uh, I got my very first pocket knife when I was eight. I got my first uh, tent and compass when I was nine. And so, uh, I guess, based on that, you can kind of tell where my, my thoughts and intentions were going. And so, a lot of times people ask me, you know, what school did you go to? Where did you train? Well, I've taken some training with Dave Canterbury, and uh, not enough to brag about, so I don't usually tell people a lot about it. But uh, I have also uh, just spent the last 40-some years uh, wandering in the woods and learning different skills. I like to tell people I went to the same school that Daniel Boone went to. It's the school of hard knocks. <laughs> but uh, 
Anyway, I love bushcraft and survival. I've been developing and honing my skills for a very, very long time. And so that's one of the reasons I started my YouTube channel was to be able to teach and to share some of the experience and knowledge and some of the tips, tricks, and techniques that I've picked up over the years. Uh, another thing that really helped me a lot is this book and many others, but this book right here. Two Little Savages. And uh, it's written by Ernest Thompson Seton. And he was one of the founding pioneers of the Boy Scouts of America. And he was a prolific writer and author. And as I said, we didn't have television, so we read a lot. And in this book, there are all kinds of diagrams and illustrations, and my bookmark fell out, and uh, of, of how to build and make things. And uh, it's a tale of, of two, uh, two little white boys who decided that they wanted to practice being uh, Native Americans. And of course, it was written in 1903. And of course, they, they called them all Indians back then. And I do get Native American from three of my four uh, grandparents. And so I have a lot of that in my blood. But that's one of the books that really influenced me in my survival and bushcraft. Number five, what is your favorite fire starting method? Well, I've demoed my, my fire kit here. And I'll be honest with you, of all the fire starting methods that I have done, and you know, I mean, if you practice this for very long, you've done a lot of things. The fire piston, the, you know, the glass, burning lens, magnifying glass, uh, you know, lighters, matches, of course, um, and uh, friction fires, uh, different things you practice when you're learning how to develop different skills. But I, my, my preferred fire lighting technique is actually my ferro rod. And I like to use my ferro rod in conjunction with uh, Vaseline uh, soaked cat cotton balls and uh, some slivers of fat wood. Uh, that's usually my go-to fire starter. I can start fires in a lot of ways, a lot of different ways with different things and different methods, but that is probably my favorite and preferred way. Uh, I find the other ways fun, but uh, if I'm going to be starting a fire, uh, I, probably for the last 15 years, I, I've just, that's kind of been just my go-to fire starter has been uh, a ferro rod, Vaseline soaked cotton balls, and some slivers of fat wood. Number six, what do you consider to be your most essential piece of kit? I really wrestled over this one. And for me, the three most essential parts of any kit are obviously your knife, your container, and whatever kind of fire starting device you prefer. And so being a custom knife maker and I, I can nap flint, I've made bone knives. Uh, I do have a fair amount of practice experience building things primitively. Uh, I've worked a little bit with making clay vessels and uh, of course you can carve things out of wood, you can make vessels. Uh, they're never quite as good as uh, obviously something you would carry and I know that other people might have their opinion but for me my most preferred piece of kit is again probably my ferro rod with my preferred striker and uh, why do I take this as, as my preferred piece of kit? Well, fire is a multi-tool. Uh, being a custom knife maker and understanding a little bit about metallurgy and all of that, if I can find some scrap metal somewhere, I can anneal it and I can work it and I can reharden it and hammer it and forge it into something useful. Uh, matter of fact, you find in some poorer countries that they do a lot of their forging even on stone, not necessarily even a steel or iron anvil, but they forge on stone. Uh, there's a lot of things you can do once you understand the basics of uh, metallurgy and working with steel and iron. But fire is a multi-tool, and with it I can make charcoal, I can make char cloth, I can boil water, I can hollow out bowls and make cups and carve spoons and all kinds of things, you know, using you know, your embers and the blowing technique. There's so many things you can use fire for. And I find that primitive fire starting, uh, especially in the part of the world where we live, it's very humid. We have a lot of humidity throughout the year. And so when you're in damp conditions, uh, primitive fire starting can be really challenging and it can really pull a lot of calories out of you to get it done. And so I can start a fire pretty quickly and pretty efficiently with a few sparks from my ferro rod. And so that is 
probably my number one most essential piece of kit. If I had to walk out of here today with just one thing, I would probably take the fire starter. Question number seven. Do you keep a bug out bag in your vehicle? No, I do not. Uh, I don't really consider that I would need to bug out. Um, obviously there's always things you know that could happen uh, uh, natural disasters and things like that I already live in a very rural part of the United States and so uh, moved out here on purpose for teaching my classes when I wanted to start my school and uh, so we moved out of here some eight nine years ago for that purpose but I do carry a survival kit and uh, carry survival kits in my various vehicles uh, and uh, they're usually small because coupled with the skills and the experience that I have and what I've taught to my family um, you know we're we're able to make do and now if I do go on long trips I will sometimes take a much larger bag with me for carrying also things. when I'm away from home uh, I don't have a bug out bag per se in my vehicle but I do have this small SOG backpack that I carry and I use this for teaching my classes uh, once a week I teach at a private school I teach bushcraft and survival to young boys from the ages of uh, 10 and 14 and so uh, really enjoy that class and so I normally have that backpack with me when I'm out and about. question number eight do you prefer to bring wood alcohol or gas stoves with you well I would say that that question uh, it's an interesting question first of all uh, I think and a, and a very good question but uh, a lot of it will depend on where I'm going uh, if, if I'm for instance doing hiking or backpacking or taking a trip into the desert southwest of the United States uh, I will uh, often bring a gas stove with me uh, because you can at times have difficulty finding firewood in some places uh, also, I've been in uh, places where it had been extremely dry for a while and there was a burn ban going on and in that sense I prefer to bring a gas canister stove with me. Uh, my favorite uh, preferred stove is right here and I did a, a review on my uh, camping cookware and uh, I like the Snow Peak uh, Giga Power set. It fits into a very small uh, titanium pot here. Uh, it comes in a just a little plastic box like and it folds up really really small like this fold out the, uh, the pot holder and then it uh, screws on like so and uh, very hot flame it's easily adjustable and it works really really well but as far as what I prefer uh, I prefer to cook over a wood fire so I really don't bring a stove much with me uh, when I'm backpacking camping bushcrafting practicing my survival skills I usually just cook over an open fire and so uh, again those those conditions can kind of vary from time to time now one thing that I will bring with me is if I'm going on a winter survival trip uh, and I know I'm going to be out somewhere where I could possibly experience hypothermia as I told you before because I've I've been in that zone before uh, I will often bring one of those very small esbit stoves with enough uh, fuel tablets for about four to six different fires depending on the size uh, and uh, I really do like bringing that with me as a backup fire starter uh, along with you know a, a Bic lighter I always carry a Bic lighter in my pocket and uh, I mean it's literally part of part of my EDC I don't smoke but I do carry a Bic lighter right next to my body where it stays warm all the time for that purpose as I said I teach classes I do a lot of things with bushcraft and survival so I'm always having to melt the ends on paracord or uh, light a fire for somebody or start something uh, you know like that uh, Esbit stove for instance so if I have it with me as well as I'll have a couple stashed away uh, in my pack and my cooking kits and uh, as many of you in this community know uh, you, there's just no uh, no real good replacement for a lighter it's instant fire instant flame and uh, if you've got one and you're in an emergency situation as long as you've got the ability to flick that uh, Bic you know you go ahead and do it because fire the quicker you can get fire started in an emergency situation the better off you are
Also, when you're talking about stoves, and the question is, do you do wood, gas, or alcohol? Uh, I've used all three of them. And uh, again, wood can be sometimes a problem, but as long as there's a lot of wood around, you never run out of fuel for your stove. And to me, that's, that's a real huge uh, benefit. Not having to carry fuel, uh, but getting it where you are whenever you get there uh, is just a huge, uh, huge deal. It's less weight to have to carry, and as I said, you never run out of fuel. The advantages of an isobutane mix, you know, type of camp stove like I have here in the Snow Peak system, is that uh, you know it, there's enough there uh, in a small canister for probably nine meals. So if you're careful and don't just let it run incessantly, you can probably uh, cook three different meals on it or boil you know nine different uh, large pots of uh, stew. So it works really, really well. I really like it. Uh, I'm not too big on alcohol stoves. I have several different alcohol stoves. I've built alcohol stoves, the small Pepsi can, you know, penny stove type things. And I do like them, but I will tell you that when it drops below freezing, uh, if you've ever had any experience with alcohol, you know it has a really hard time uh, getting to that superheated point where it actually turns into a gas and begins to burn well. Uh, I've actually seen it cold enough where you couldn't light an alcohol stove. I had a friend that took one with us on a winter camping trip several years ago and he couldn't get it to light just because the alcohol was too cold. And so uh, there's a lot of factors in that. For lightweight, fast backpacking, uh, fast trekking, whatever you want to call it, I would say that'll probably be fine. But uh, again, alcohol has its issues. You got to carry fuel, you can spill it. Uh, and as Dave said on Really Big Monkey One, uh, you can't hardly see the flame. I mean, if it's in daylight like this, it's, it's really hot, it'll burn you. And you cannot see that, that alcohol flame burning. So that, that's a problem. All right now, for our tags. I got five tags to do. The first tag is I want to tag a young guy. His uh, channel is Alive Dash Ready. And uh, so uh, actually it might be alive hyphen ready, but I'll go ahead and put the links in the description. So uh, look forward to hearing from you. Consider yourself tagged. Uh, number two, uh, I want to tag Andy Froy. Uh, he uh, does survival bushcraft and survival classes. He's a guy over in the UK, I believe. And so Andy Froy, consider yourself tagged. And then uh, number three, I want to tag the Kentucky Woodsman. He's been around for a while and uh, he's got a lot of great ideas, really good guy. So uh, go ahead and uh, check him out as well and look up the Kentucky Woodsman. Number four, the uh, MI Woodsman or the, the uh, Michigan Woodsman. Uh, I'm assuming he's from Michigan, is it MI? So uh, just uh, want to tag you as well. Just a new guy I just discovered uh, not too long ago and uh, seems to have some really good ideas and he's a newer channel and he could use some subs. So appreciate you going over and checking him out. And then another great guy that I've enjoyed watching is uh, Liberty Rogue Outdoors. And so uh, he's uh, got a lot of energy and he's got a lot of fun stuff on his channel and teaches some good things. So uh, go over to Liberty Rogue Outdoors and check him out and, and uh, Liberty Rogue, consider yourself tagged. This is James Bender for Waypoint Survival. Please like, share and subscribe and make sure and press that bell button to stay notified of all of our upcoming videos and we'll talk to you next time.